right, good evening. So. Good evening, Brother Nick. <laughs> that was pretty deep, man. Yes. My, voice, my voice has gotten deeper since I've been sick, so kind of got this James Earl Jones thing going on, maybe one day. All right, one day. One day it'll happen. So. A quick passage of scripture for you guys tonight. Uh, this is in John chapter 4, Jesus and the, uh, the woman from Samaria, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well. John, John chapter 4 verse 22 says, You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. And we're all, as Christians, joined together by the Holy Spirit. And the truth is that there is no God but Jesus our Lord, right? He is uh, the way, the truth, and the life. And so just by recognizing that, you're worshiping Him tonight. So I'm excited about that. Um, You'll notice a few announcements on your bulletin, um, as Brother David, I'm sure, has spoken to you this morning about. Um, don't forget the Harvest Night with the Trunks with Treats, Wednesday, October 29th at 5 p.m. We're still looking for folks who want to uh, put together a trunk or a, a hatch or whatever you, what kind of, whatever kind of car you drive, I don't care. Just, uh, um, you know, let Cassie know. She's got a, her number down there, so you can give her a call and let her know we're doing Bible themes. So, real exciting to, to do that, um, to bless our kids here and also the kids from the neighborhood. Uh, but if you don't have a car, some people don't. So if you don't have a car or you don't want to dress your car up or something like that, decorate it. Dress your car kind of sounds a little weird, but decorate it, you know. Uh, you can donate candy. You can donate candy. You could give that to, uh, you drop it by the church office or uh, like I say, give it to Cassie or myself and uh, we will save it until the October 29th. Okay. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, we're excited that you're here tonight. We're excited about this new kind of order of, uh, of worship and uh, the way that we're doing our Sunday nights. Um, where we're worshiping and then we're splitting up into smaller groups. I hope you're excited about that and you're getting plugged in somewhere. So, um, but uh, church members, let's stand right now and uh, let's greet Dude, one another, on okay? Verse. Get the verse and the chorus. Two, three, four. One and
seated as we join together seeing you are my all in all Do you mind leading us, please, sir? I invite you to stand again as we sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
may be seated. This next song is uh, Chris Tomlin. It's called More Than Enough. And it talks about how he is all that we need for everything in our lives. All of you is more. able to do more abundantly than what we even ask or think. Amen. It's our time for our evening offering.
Man, Miss, Miss Carolyn knows what knobs to push at the right time, doesn't she? She can make that Allen sound almost like a Hammond. That's awesome. I love it. We just need two big Leslies up there and we'd be in good shape, wouldn't we? <laughs> Alrighty, it's uh, good to see everybody tonight. Uh, just a reminder of where, Brother Chuck, your class is going to be right back behind the sanctuary. So uh, the class that Dorothy and I are doing, if it's your first time, we'll be up in where Butch teaches Sunday school, which is couples what? Couples three department. And then ladies are going to the fellowship hall, is that correct? Women's ministry is fellowship hall. And Brother Kevin, we'll want y'all to come toward the front here and we will dismiss and uh, so hope you have great classes tonight it's great to be in the Lord's house amen, amen. Always check. All right, good evening to you. Glad you're here. And it's a delight to be in the house of the Lord. Welcome to everyone who's present. Welcome to any guests that may be here tonight. Um, I hope that this will be a very positive time for you. Now the world is looking for an answer. We're in 1 Peter, still in chapter 1. But the world's looking for an answer. And uh, the question that, that uh, they ask very often is, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, how many of you recognize the name Thomas Duncan? Well, some of you do and some of you do not, but you will in just a moment. Mr. Duncan uh, was a man who traveled to the United States from the nation of Liberia, now you know, and uh, he got over there to Dallas. His purpose in coming here was to propose to his girlfriend and get married. Uh, that's why he came. Uh, so far as we know, from reports that I've read, he was a Christian. He was a Christ follower, so far as we know. Well, he became ill. He went to a hospital in Dallas, and he was turned away with 103 fever, nonetheless, turned away, sent back to his house, and we know the rest of the story. He died. Um, he died before he was able to propose to his girlfriend. He was not, so far as we know, a bad man. He was a man. He was, as I said, a professing Christian, and he's dead. He died. I could have mentioned to you the two-year-old I read about uh, who died of, of uh, this mystery virus, that's what they're calling it, the enterovirus that's going around and, and uh, impacting people. I could have mentioned that little two-year-old uh, who also died, and the week before that, Another six-year-old died of the same virus, and I could have mentioned a number of other things like that. So, what I'm saying is bad things happen to good people. And um, bad things happen to Christians. Christians fall ill. Christians get cancer. I don't know a better man than my brother. Generous to a fault. Will 
do whatever he can. I've seen him rise up in the wee hours of the morning to take someone for a hospital appointment and stay with them all day long, get in late at night, and then go take care of his father-in-law and leave there and go, go see and check on our mother um, doing all of these things. I don't know a better man than he is, but yet he got that news a year and a half ago when the doctor called him in and said, you have cancer and you're at stage four and this is pretty serious. And uh, they've operated on him and, and he's in remission, by the way. But, um, you know, this was a pretty stunning thing. He's a good man. He's a Christian man. He's chairman of deacons in his church. And he got sick. Ch the Christian's children will go astray. They're just up and everything you've taught them, they'll say fooey on that and they will leave. They will do just like the prodigal son and they'll say, give me my portion, my inheritance, I'm gone, I'm out of here. And they'll go and they will live a life wasting their money every way they possibly can. Christian children die, children of Christians will die. Um, it's no secret, y'all know, I buried my granddaughter, age three months. Children of Christians will die. Christians lose their jobs. Bad things happen to Christian people. And so we're looking at that, and we're looking at the reasons that are found in Peter for these bad things. And one of the reasons we uncovered last week as we began this study, and that's the fact that our faith is going to be tested. Now that test is not for God, it's so you'll know what your faith is like. But we need a proven faith, we need a tested faith, uh, so that we know how to be strengthened and, and, and um, how, to, how to go farther with our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, we're going to continue forward in the passage. I really wanted to skip forward to the end of the second chapter and go into the third chapter, but I just was arrested by this as I'm talking about this whole subject of why Christians suffer. I felt like I needed to do what I read, just one little portion of a sentence, not even an entire sentence that I read um, yesterday, not yesterday, but um, uh, Thursday or Friday as I was going through my notes one more time and I saw this uh, in, in something that I was reading that, that said that Peter, before he could really talk about suffering, and he wanted to talk about it, but before he could do that, he had to talk about our, our, our submission, our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he brought that out to us uh, in, in these verses that we're going to look at tonight. He brought out the need for our submission and the need for our submission and, and, and um, how it arises from our identification with Christ. Now, I told you something. We ended this morning with a very powerful verse from 1 John chapter 4. And the last part of that verse, verse 17, because as he is, do you remember what the verse said? This is a test. As he is, so are we in this world. Y'all need to memorize that. As he is, so are we in this world. And I need to talk to us tonight a little bit about our identification with Christ and the subsequent submission that comes from our identification with Christ. So if you want to understand suffering properly, you have to also understand submission. Uh, these principles are, are interlocked and one cannot be explained without the other one. They're necessary for one another. I need a volunteer to read uh, chapter 1 verses 13 through 17. And everybody needs to follow along as it's read. Who's going to read that? Mary, you going to read that for us? Chapter 1, 13 through 17. And this is what we're going to do. Here's, here's where you come in on this. 
there are five commands in there and uh, without going into all the detail of language and syntax and everything else these commands are couched uh, actually in the original in, in participles but uh, these five commands are there for us in these verses 13 through 17 and I want us to identify those commands I have them written down here on my page but I want us to identify these five commands and once we've read the text, I'm going to give you a minute to find those five commands. You may consult with someone. This is not a singular test. You're allowed to talk amongst one another. And I want us to come up with a consensus uh, on what these five commands are. Go. Thank you. All right. Take a look at the passage. You heard it. You have it in front of you with your Bible. Some of you have your Bible on your tablet, some on your smartphone, some have a hard copy like I do tonight. Take a look at it quickly. Talk with one another and start calling out the commands that you see in there. Prepare your mind. Okay. Be sober minded. Okay. Be self-controlled, obedient, holy, set your hope fully on the grace. Okay, those are actually five commands. You pulled them out. That wasn't hard, was it? Now, um, that's, by the way, how you study a passage of Scripture. One of the ways that you study is you go through and you look for the imperatives that are in there. One of the ways I would teach on the mission field when we would teach people how to study Scripture, we would, we would walk through this process and we would look for promises of God and we would look for examples to follow. We would look for sins to avoid, but you also look for specific commands. Are there any specific commands for us? Is there action we must take, in other words? And that was always the fun part because we'd get to that part. Well, are there, is there any action? Are there any commands there for us? And one of the lessons that I would most often use as I taught this, introduced it, was uh, the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch. And I always like to teach this to new believers. This is how you study the Bible. And I'd get down to that, is there any action that needs to be taken? And they'd say, yeah, we need to be baptized. And I wouldn't even have to talk to them about it. They would come to their own conclusion and we'd set up, we'd set up for that. Isn't that neat? I mean, that's a, one of the things you do with the Word of God. Are there any commands in here that speak to me directly um, that, that imply, apply to my life? And you pulled them out right there. I'm going to walk through them over just a few minutes time and then move on and the first one now I've got in I've got here the New King James you read from the NIV uh, Mary which is fine that's good uh, it I like the way it read it prepare your minds for action isn't that what it says uh, gird the loins of your mind now the exact prepare your mind for action is a word picture of what gird your loins meant prepare yourself for action and so you need to take your mind and you need to prepare your mind for action. God, let me back up. The biggest battle that you're going to face every day, no matter where you are, no matter what your stage in life, is going to take place within your mind. And there is a strong battle going on for the mind. Uh, way back, I'm talking all the way back in 1977, I bought this book called The Battle for the Mind. And it was one of the most complicated books I ever tried to read um, because I was really naive and didn't understand a lot about life. And I sure didn't understand a whole lot about Scripture. But that is one of the important 
truths and things that are out there. So the Lord tells us that we need to do certain things with our mind. Somebody read Romans 12 too as an example and this will show you how important your mind is. Romans 12 too. Okay, thank you. Now stand up and turn around and read it to him out loud where everybody can hear you. Turn, 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 turn. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a tough teacher. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Thank you. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. You need to have a ready or a renewed mind. Now let me ask you a question. You, you prepare your mind for action. You get your mind ready. You have to renew your mind. How? What are some ways that you can renew your mind? What are some things that you should be doing that will enable you to renew your mind? Well, very good. Scripture. Scripture. How much time do you spend, don't answer this out loud, but how much time do you spend in Scripture, reading Scripture? How much time do you spend in the Word of God? I spoke with one of our church members recently who spoke to me and said to me, do you know my involvement with the Word of God for the longest time was reading my devotional book and the little Bible verse at the top of the devotional book, and that's what I did. And then one day I decided I wanted to pick up the Word of God and I wanted to just read it. And now I really love and look forward to reading the Bible on a regular basis. And amen to that. Hallelujah to that. We need to have a regular diet of the Word of God. How many of you have a Bible reading plan? Don't raise your hand. How many of you have a Bible reading plan? You need a plan to read Scripture. Um, just share with you uh, as an example. They have, they have uh, out there, and you can find it on, on um, you know, if you like the electronic kind of Bible, they will have that Bible reading plan set up for you. You can find it over there under the menus, and there'll be Bible reading plans there. Or a lot of Bibles will have it. If you have a study Bible, thank you, they will have it in that study Bible where you can have a Bible reading plan. And it usually most of those plans are written where you will read through the Bible, the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation, um, in a year's time, reading approximately three chapters a day. Doc. Right. Open windows. It's in the open windows, is it not? The daily Bible reading plan? And the Sunday school quarterly. That's another source for that, for you to be able to uh, renew your mind with the Word of God. How else can you renew your mind? Prayer. Thank you. Prayer, I, I can't talk to you about how important it is for you to communicate with your Heavenly Father. I cannot overstress that, but neither can I uh, overstate how difficult that is sometimes. Because your carnal nature, your old sinful nature, absolutely hates prayer. And you're going to find every way under the sun. devil doesn't like it when you pray either. They can't stand it. And I don't know if it happens to you, but if I start getting into a really good prayer time, things happen, like the phone rings, or somebody wants to see me, or it's an emergency, or you absolutely have to take this call right now, and I take the call, and they say, well, I heard thus and such. I got that one this week. And um, I try to be very self-controlled, but this time I said, 
which can communicate a lot of different things from a pastor when you say it over a telephone. And I didn't mean to, but it just kind of came out <laughs> in that moment. But folks, that's what happens to you. And th these kinds of things will take place, but you need to spend time with God to renew your mind. And by the way, what we're doing right now will also help you to renew your mind. This, this, uh, this time that we had of, of worship and, and now of study of the Word of God helps us to renew our mind. I spent a long time on that. I want to I move off of that. I want to go through some of the rest of this. The next command in there, um, in the New King James, says, Be sober. Now, somehow I don't think he's talking about Bud Light. What do y'all think? <laughs> By the way, you do know in the Hebrew, when it talked about strong drink and it said wine's a mocker and strong drink is raging, y'all remember that passage that we used to have to memorize when we believed that drinking was wrong? Um, some of us still believe that, by the way. Uh, that word strong drink there in the Hebrew is barley beer. Oh, well, yeah, it is. That NIV you have in your hand actually uses the word beer. And so this is, this is something, you know, we think, well, what's the big deal going out and having a brew with your friend? Let's go to Brewski's, man. Let's have something with our friends. I want to tell you something. The Lord says that's, it's raging. It's absolutely an outrageous thing for you to do that kind of activity. That's another sermon. That's not what we're talking about right now. That's not what the word sober means. How was it written in the NIV there? Prepare your mind for action, then the next thing it said. Be self-controlled. Self okay, that's an okay translation. But let me tell you what it means. The word sober means, number one, to be cautious. To be cautious. Number two, it means to be calm. Because you see, um, one of the biggest temptations I think we have is to overreact to information. And so, be calm. And then three, it means to be collected. To be cautious, to be calm, to be collected. This is, what the, this is what it's talking about when self-control falls into that last definition, Mary, uh, to be collected. Um, you, need, you need to have your wits about you, is what it's saying. And, and that's what he's coming, uh, the, the point that he's coming to there. But then there's a third command that he gives us. Um, set your hope. Set your hope. What do you set your hope on? Look at that again. On Mississippi State being number one? <laughs> I had to throw it in. <laughs> set your hope grace. on grace. But now, now finish reading that. On the grace of what? That's right. This is all about the return of Christ. On the grace related to the return of Christ. It's a grace that's going to be revealed when Christ comes again. You say, oh, you guys talking about Jesus coming back. I, you know, and you're going to hear all kinds of stuff about that uh, out there today. How many of you have seen the Left Behind movie that just came out? Have you, have you all seen it? No, I give it about a three out of five. Maybe a bottom side of three there. 2.9, you know. Um, it's okay. It's good. Everybody walked out of there just kind of quiet and sober-minded. <laughs> Literally, they were very quiet. In fact, somebody said, wow, that's the quietest I've ever heard a theater when a movie ended. 
because it made them think. I mean, there's this one scene where this, I don't want to spoil it for you in case you want to go see it, but this, this girl is hugging her little brother and he says, I love you, and boom, he's gone. And she's not holding anything all of the sudden. Now, in all of these movies, the clothes always stay behind. I don't know if it's going to be that way or not. Uh, I don't have an inside word from the Lord on whether our clothes remain behind or not. It doesn't really matter to me. I don't think it's going to matter in the long run. But she's just holding his jacket all of a sudden, you know, looking down at this nothing that's there. And, and the shock... Everybody in that theater gasped when they saw that, including, well, never mind. They, they gasped. Listen to me. In the twinkling of an eye, the Lord Jesus is coming again. And when he comes, there's grace that he's going to give to every Christ follower. There's grace. I mean, we have lived by grace. We were saved by grace. We serve the Lord by grace. We're able to sing in difficult times through grace. We'll talk about suffering, grace to suffer uh, before we finish all of this. Uh, and, and all of these, these different manifestations of grace, but there's one more grace that's yet to be ours. We're going to have the grace to be able to see our Lord Jesus. Christ. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting, um, and, and we're going to have to wonder about that. I keep hearing people saying, you're too heavenly minded to be any earthly good, but I have never met a person that truly, that truly anticipated the return of Christ that wasn't good on this earth, that wasn't valuable on this earth. I reckon somebody existed like that. I mean, there was the monastic order, you know, the monks that were out there that, that spent all their time delving into the Word of God and never mixed with society and that sort of thing. But um, I don't think that's generally true because a person who's anticipating the return of Christ lives according to the prayer of Christ Jesus, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if we're praying that prayer, we're going to be busy in kingdom work here on earth. Then there's another thing that he tells us um, that, that, that needs to happen. And that's that great verse over in about verse 16 of the passage of Scripture. Verses 15 and 16 of this passage of Scripture. He tells us that we need to be holy. Even as he is holy. But he says this, this is something that just kind of jumped off the page at me uh, in verse 15. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And that word conduct is actually used eight times in this letter. I checked it out, went through it and checked it out. And it always refers to your lifestyle. And this is, this is important. This is God's command for us. If we're going to understand suffering properly, then this needs to be one of the things that describes our life, holiness. Our lifestyle must be characterized by holiness. Which means it needs to look a whole lot like Jesus, doesn't it? It needs to be godly. It needs to be God-like. So what does that look like to you? What does a holy lifestyle look like to you? Interpret that for me. Apply it. It means, the word means set apart. I just interpreted it. Okay, so you apply it. Go ahead. In the world, but not of it. How does that look? Mr. Willis? Had to pause when the kids came to the room. 
one, I know that I personally was not affected by, you know, the necessarily the things I was watching. It just, for me, it was like water off the, off the duck's back. But I'm not the only person that happens. And so I had to be a good steward of my family. I had to be a good example okay. of my family. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. So that's one of the areas that, that um, has been a struggle for folks. And uh, Ray Comfort has this great video out there. You want to YouTube, uh, you want to Google it on YouTube. It's his actual company is called Living Waters. And the video is called Noah. And he does all these interviews. And it's related around Noah. But he asks all these other questions in it about lifestyle and the holiness in lifestyle. And he, and he points out that the Bible says in, in the last days that people are going to be like it was in the days of Noah. And so are you involved in this, involved in that? And he's got all kinds of, I'm not going to tell you what all's in there. I don't want to get off in that. But it's a good one to watch. Noah by Ray Comfort. It's great. It's fascinating. It's about 30 minutes long. It's worth the time to watch it. Um, it's very, very good. So keep that in mind. Your lifestyle your lifestyle. But then verse 17 gives the last command there, and we're going to move off from that because I have another few things I want to show. We're going to, this is all the what, and we're going to talk about why in just a moment. Um, so there in verse 17, there's one more thing, one more command. What is it? Conduct yourselves with fear. There's that word conduct again. And this time it's not conduct, it's conduct. But it's the, same, it's the same general word there. Conduct yourselves in fear. In fear of what? In fear of what? What do you think that's referring to when it says conduct yourselves in fear? Fear of what? Fear of the Lord. Fear of... Staining his name. How's that sound to you? Of bringing reproach on the name of the Lord. How many of you, when you're out there in your day by day life, how many of you stop and take stock? What I'm about to say, what I'm about to do is going to reflect on my Lord and on my church. How many of you do that? Because what you do and what you say has a direct bearing and if people know, if they look at Matt and they say, well Matt's a deacon over there at 38th Avenue and did you just hear what came out of his mouth? Uh, not that he would, but that's an example. Um, you, you see what I'm saying? Uh, that is that is something we must we must impress upon our minds, and that's what God says to us in His Word. Now we're going to pick up verse 17 again and read through 25. Somebody read that for me now. 17 through 25. Um, who's going to read that? Jeremy, not you. Okay, Sarah, stand up, turn around, be heard. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've been given these five commands. 
And I don't know about y'all, but when I hear something and somebody says, I need you to do this, there's a question that comes to my mind an awful lot. And that's the question, why? You know, um, my grandson loves that question. Why? You, you should never ask it that way, especially to me, by the way. Um, that will not win you any favor with me. But um, this, is, this is one of the questions that God answers for us in this passage because he knows our nature, he created us, and he knows we need this reason. And so there are five reasons in there. Since we're about to run short on time, instead of having you call them out, I'm going to walk you through them. Is that okay? Would you mind if I did that? Number one, we have an impartial judge. We have an impartial judge. You call on the Father without partiality, uh, who judges without partiality according to each one's work. We have an impartial judge. So he's looking at what you do. He's looking at how you respond to suffering. He's looking at how you live your life. And he does not say, okay, well... Doc went to Mississippi State, and they're number one, so we're going to give him a pass on this. He doesn't do that. In fact, he might say, I don't like Mississippi State. I like Ole Miss, and they're number three, so Doc, you get a double taste of it. You know, I don't think it works that way. Uh, not at all. But... Um, we have this impartial judge who looks at everyone equally and he, he judges equally with each one. And then the next thing he talks about is the price of our redemption. You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. Did you know this image that he's using, a slave could buy his way out of slavery in the Greco-Roman world. They could save up their money. Most slaves actually got paid, kind of like you do today at the job where you work. And they got paid and they could save up their money and they could eventually buy their freedom and they would earn and, and receive this, this, this document that declared themselves to be free. And uh, that was actually part of what was written uh, in the book of Galatians that it tells you to stand fast in your liberty or as it's written in some versions, it is uh, for freedom that you have been set free. And that statement was written on those documents for freedom he was set free and it was a declaration that was made so they would take the price of that silver or gold and they would go down to the local temple and they would say um, I'm giving this money to the goddess of whomever and she's buying my freedom and the Lord says no that's not how it is you were not purchased like that with silver or gold or anything else that's corruptible. You're purchased through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're purchased for that. And the purpose of your purchase was the purification of your souls, which he tells us in the same passage of Scripture down at verse 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. There's that phrase again. And um, listen to me. Here's what he's saying to you. When you repent, and until you repent and believe the gospel, your soul is not purified. But the day you repent and believe the gospel, your soul is purified by this blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the next thing he shares, the next reason why is he did this for obedience to the truth of God's word. That's why he's done what he's done for us. And finally, if I can just spell it out, because you're born again. That's why you need to do these things. All of this points to the doctrine of submission and identification with Jesus Christ. The evidence that I find myself identified with Christ is my submission 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. If I am not submissive to Christ, it's because I do not understand what Jesus has done for me and who I am in Christ Jesus. But when I understand who I am in Christ Jesus, then I become submissive to Christ Jesus. And I desire to do His will. And when I desire to do His will, sometimes, excuse me, sometimes things happen. And sometimes they're not so pleasant. Let me tell you about Adoniram Judson. This is another missionary story. Um, What less would you expect from me? But Adoniram Judson, 19th century, early 1800s, was, was a missionary, a Baptist missionary who went to Burma, Myanmar, modern-day Myanmar. And he went to Burma, and there he served, and there he lived uh, in the nation of Burma, trying to share the gospel. Year after year after year went by, and nobody came to Christ, but he continued on teaching the Word of God and witnessing to folks and sharing the Word of God and translating into the Burmese language, translating the Word of God. I don't have time to tell the whole story. There's a really neat story related to that translation um, work that he was doing where it started a move of God, a people movement that took place. But... um, the part that I want you to know about his life, that before this took place, before this happened, there he is with his wife and his children, and everywhere he went, he was persecuted. And they'd beat him. One day he came home and his shirt was literally in tatters and blood all over his back where they whipped him for preaching the gospel. He was caned. And then another day, they came to his house, and they arrested him, and they took him to prison. And the torture he underwent during those two years in prison are are unspeakable things. Meanwhile, there's his wife and his children, and no one to take care of them, and no money. And you can count the ribs on the kids because they're so hungry. And he's being tortured in prison and there they are. And they grew weaker and weaker and eventually the children died of smallpox. The wife, um, because of all the diseases, had to have all of her hair shaved off her head. And she was wearing literally just tattered rags, all she had. Somebody, they pronounced a death sentence on him and somebody smuggled him out of the prison. And it took him a long time to find his wife and that's how he found her. Just a few months later, she died. And now he has no one. And he stayed there 30 years before his first furlough. 30. I was ready after three years. I didn't come home after three, but I was ready after three. 30 years. And when he came home, somebody said, How could you do this? All of the suffering. All that he went through? How could you do this? He said, there's this verse in Ephesians 3. And there's a phrase in that verse that says, to know the love of Christ. He said, I did this because I wanted to know the love of Christ. And that's what Christ had for me. Before he took that, that furlough after 30 years, 
he had already led a number of people to Christ and had a church of more than a hundred in the village where he lived. And the word of God spread through that area. Submission is easy as long as you don't have to suffer. But when it comes to having to suffer, I don't know about y'all. It gets pretty tough for me. Then I say, Lord, I don't, I don't know about this pressure you're putting on me right now. I don't know about this. Let's talk this over. Would you please let me talk to you a few minutes about this? It gets a little difficult at that time. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you. I love your word. I wish we could spend an hour in it. I just pray that you'll bless us and teach us more and more every week from your word. And help us to learn to respond as, as, as would please you, as you desire of us. We bless you tonight. We thank you. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all listen to me. Y'all listen to me. I don't know why, but I feel like here in the United States, we're very close to a time of suffering. And I believe God's trying to prepare us for something. And I want you to take these lessons to heart. Good night.